So I had to write a little network client recently in Go. And the paper is pretty straightforward, right? All you need to do is connect to a server and then send a command. And then I'll make sure the command completed OK. And then I'm going to send another command. So connecting to the server, I'm just going to use dial to do this. I pass in some information. It gives me back a network connection. Then I can take this connection and I can, oh, hey, Gopher. What's up? What if it goes wrong? That's a good point, actually, because the connection might not succeed. So I need to check the error that comes back from this. And if I get an error, well, I guess I just want to print it out. I can deal with it by hand and rerun the script. But now I'm secure. I've got my connection. And the first thing to do is send a command over this. So I can just use write to send the command. And after we send the command, we can, hi. Well, that goes wrong. That's actually a good point as well. I really ought to check the error that comes back from calling write. And again, you know, if it goes wrong, I'll just print it out, and I can deal with it by hand and rerun the script. <laughs> but after we've successfully written the command, we need to make sure it ran OK. So we're going to read the response that comes back from the server. Then we can take that re OK, right. We'll check the error that comes back when we're trying to read the response. And if there's an error, I'll just print it out, and I'll deal with it by hand and rerun it, OK? But assuming it worked OK, we're going to take that response. We're going to check it's OK. And then the last thing we're going to do is send another command through. And once we send, really? OK. <laughs> so we're going to check the error that comes back from there. And if it goes wrong, we'll print it out and deal with it and so on. Now, don't get me wrong. I think handling errors is a good thing. And I really like that Go pushes me to handle errors better. But the problem I'm finding here is that the error handling is getting in the way of the code. I don't like that. And it's not that much of a problem when I'm writing the code. I mean, it's OK to throw in another conditional here and there. The bigger problem I have is when I come back to read it and try and understand it and maybe change the code. Because what I want to do is look at some code that looks a bit like this, and I can read through and get an idea of what it's trying to do. And what I see when I look at it is something that looks more like this, and that's much harder to deal with. <laughs> so I was thinking, you know, there must be a better solution to this. Now. <laughs> It's worth pointing out that this doesn't happen all the time in Go, but it does happen sometimes. So when it happened to me, I thought, you know, maybe the Go community has already solved this. So I took a look on the Googles, and I found this article by Rob Pike called Errors of Values. I don't just want to read it out on stage, but I do want to go through the way it works, because I think some of this is quite interesting. So we go back and look at when we're trying to write a command to our network connection. Now, it's kind of obvious, but this con, this variable, is not actually the network, right? It's an abstraction on top of that. And more concretely, what I mean is it's a value in Go, and it's a value that has some data about the connection and then some behavior so I can use it. And when I say that it's a value with some data and some behavior, what I really mean is that this is determined by its type in Go. Now, I want to change the behavior, right? I want to augment the behavior so that we handle errors a bit better. So what I'm going to do there is create a new type. So I'm going to create a type. I'm going to call this safecon. And the first thing I'm going to do is take our underlying network connection and just put that inside there. But I'm also going to add a field to keep track of any errors that come up as we go. OK, now I can take this, and I can add some behavior to it. I'm going to add this so I can send commands across the connection. And initially, all I'm going to do is take the command and just pass it straight through to the underlying connection. But this is where it gets a bit more interesting, because I'm going to take this and add some error handling to it. Right? So I'm going to look at the error that comes back from calling write. I'm going to store this inside my new type. And then crucially, I'm also going to add a guard at the top of this and say, if something went wrong previously in my program, I'm not even going to try and execute this. I'm just going to return immediately. And now we can take this safe con and use it, and then call write on it a couple of times. And crucially, if you call write the first time and it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. We can still call write the second time. It just won't do anything. It's safe to do. Now, I still care about the error, so I can add some error handling at the end and say, if anything went wrong at all in my program, we'll just print it out. I'll, I'll deal with it by hand and fix it and rerun it. Now, that copes with the errors that come up with write. There were other errors in the program. I need to do this kind of process for all of the other errors. So for example, when I'm connecting to the network, this could also return an error. I'll do a similar process, right? I'll just write a new function. It'll take similar arguments to before. And I'm going to pass them through to the underlying connection. But then we'll take the connection, and then also any error that comes back from that, and we'll just wrap them up inside our new safecon type. So now I can connect to my server by calling safe dial. And then I can take that connection, and I can call write on it a couple of times. Then finally, at the end, I can check and see if anything went wrong, and then print out an error message if it did. And crucially, if the connection fails, right, so this first line of code goes wrong, then I can safely call the next two lines of code, and they don't do anything, nothing bad happens. 
So we do still handle the error, and that's good, but we handle the error, and it doesn't get in the way of the rest of the code. So I can go back and read this code, and I've got a much better idea of understanding the intention behind it. But there's a cost to this, right? Because we introduced a new abstraction, and abstractions tend to have costs. And the cost we have here is that if you look at this code and think, what happens if my first write command fails, the code that you're looking at doesn't tell you anymore. You have to go and dig around inside the implementation of SafeCon to understand what's going on. So we did make the intention clearer, but we did it at the expense of hiding some of the details. But I don't think that's that big a deal, right? We do this quite a lot. We do use abstractions all the time. In fact, at the beginning, when we talked about the underlying connection object, that in itself is, a, is an abstraction, and that hides some details. So the real question is not whether or not we are using the abstraction or whether or not abstractions have costs. The important question to ask is, is this abstraction appropriate in this situation? Now, I can't answer that for you, and I don't actually care about the answer to that, or I don't really care about error handling, because I'm much more interested in the technique we use to approach this problem. I'm going to take that technique and apply it to some other code. So I'm going to create a very artificial situation here. It's a very simple piece of code, but I'm going to use it to, to sort of dive deep into what's going on. I want to write a function that takes three numbers, or A, B, and C, and just divides them together. Okay, so that's easy to write in Go. We write a function, it takes three numbers, divides them together, and prints out the answer. And we can call it passing in, say, 100, 10, and 2, and it divides them together and gives us the answer 5. And that's fine, but then what happens if we change the 2 at the end for a 0, and we try and divide by 0? Well, what happens in this code is it explodes, you get a runtime error. I don't really want that. I want it to handle the error in a nicer way. I want it to tell me what's gone wrong. Ideally, I'd like it to say something like, you can't divide by zero. So how do we make the code do that? Well, I know a really bad way of doing that, right? We just take our original code and we whack a conditional at the front. And we'll say, if b is zero or c is zero, then we know we're going to encounter a division by zero at some point, so we'll print out that error message. And we'll return early so we don't try and do the division because we know it's going to break. But then otherwise, we we'll actually will do the division and we'll print out the answer. And it maybe doesn't look that bad in this very simple example, but what we've done is we've taken our nice, clear, readable code and we just vomited conditionals over the top of it. And this feels kind of familiar, and I was thinking, right, is this the same as the error handling problem we had before? And if it is the same, can we use the same solution? Right, the solution we used before was we created a new type, and then we took our initial value, we wrapped it up inside this type, and then we took our behavior, and we moved that into the type, and then most interestingly, we took our conditionals and put that in the type as well. So let's give that a go, right? Let's create a new type. So I'm going to create a type called the divideinator, because that sounds really cool. <laughs> I'm just going to give it a single field here. It's going to keep track of the answer as we go along. Then I'm going to wrap up the initial value. Well, that's very straightforward, right? We just take our initial value, in this case, the first number A, and like, literally wrap it up inside the dividenator. Then I'm going to wrap the behavior. And what I mean by wrap the behavior is, really, I'm going to add a function to my new type that does the same behavior as I had before. And the behavior I had before was division, right? So I just take the division, and I move it into a function on my new type. And then the most interesting bit for me is wrapping the conditional, right? We don't want to do the division when we have a zero. So we can put a guard at the start of our function that says, if we're going to divide by zero, don't do it. Just return straight away. And I'm going to keep track of this as well. I'm going to put it into a new field called is zero. And the reason I do that is because when we come to print out the answer, we also have some conditionals in there. We want to say, when we're printing it out, if we had a division by zero, print out the error message. Otherwise, just print out the answer. And we can put this back together again, right? We can take our initial value A, wrap it inside our new type, divideinator. We can divide by B, we can divide by C, and then print out the answer. And then we can call it with original arguments, like 100, 10, and 2, and that works. But also, we can call it passing in some zeros, and it copes with those situations. And that's not very interesting code, right? What's interesting to me is that we use the same approach here as we use for the error handling. And that approach is we create a new type, we wrapped up the initial value, we wrapped up the behavior, and we wrapped up the conditional. I think this is really interesting. I want to understand this as well as I can. And to do that, I'm going to use something that's a little bit unusual. We don't do that often. But I want to start looking at the shape of the code we're writing. So let's look at the simple case of division first. Right? We start off with a value of 100, and then we divide it by 10, and that transformed it into a new value of 10. Then we did another step where we divide by 2, and that transforms it into the value of 5. This is a very simple shape. right? It's just a, a nice, straightforward, clear sequence of steps. And if I want to understand the overall behavior, what I can do is say, well, the overall behavior is just the composition of these steps, right? It's one step followed by another one. But then when we introduce the handling of division by zero, the shape changes. It looks a bit more like this. We start branching out. And it's harder to understand, but also crucially, I can no longer say that the overall behavior is just the composition of the steps involved, because that's no longer true. 
So it sold us what we did. We took the initial value and we lifted it into new type, right? It's like we picked up the 100 here and we put it inside the dividinator. And then we lift the behavior as well. So we pick up the division and we put that into a method on the dividinator. We do that for all of the divisions. And then the last part, and the most confusing part, is lifting the conditionals. Right, we take these branches and we pick those up and put them into the dividinator as well. So that when we follow those branches, we end up in the same place as we would have ended up had we had a positive number to divide by. And then what we're left with on top is this line that's got this nice, clear, straightforward sequence of steps. And then crucially, again, I can look at this and say, I now understand the overall behavior again because it's just the composition of the individual steps involved here. If we look at this shape, it's very similar to what we had when we were trying to write to the network. Right? Again, we have this linear sequence of writes on the connection, and that's fine. But when we add error handling, we get these branches coming off as well. And the solution was the same. Right? We take our initial value, we lift it into new type, we lift the behavior, and we lift the exceptional cases. And this gives us a nice, clean, linear structure where we can say the overall behavior is just the composition of the individual parts. And in general, we can say that we have some code that looks a bit like this, and then we also have some exceptional states it can get into. Then we know how to fix this. We take the initial value A, and we lift it using type T to give us a new value TA. Then we take our piece of behavior, in this case the function F, and we lift that into T as well. And this gives us a new value of TB, and TB is the equivalent of getting to B and lifting it using type T, or getting to the exceptional state and lifting that using type T as well. Then we repeat that for all of the behavior. And we're left with this nice, clean, linear structure in the top, and we can say the overall behavior of our code now is just the composition of the steps involved. Yeah, it's good advice. I don't really want to get too deep into the math here, but I am quite interested in how we can take this thinking and apply it to real code. So I want to go back to another project I've been working on recently. It's a little web app. And it's actually called doesgohavegeneric.com. And the idea is you can sign up to this, and every month it sends you an email, and it says, actually, it's fine. We don't really need generics, and nobody likes them anyway. So I was working the sign-up function for this, and it's really just a sequence of steps, right? So when you sign up, you give us an email address, and we're going to check it looks like a valid email. And then we're going to make sure you haven't previously registered, and assuming that all checks out, we will register you. And then, most importantly, I'm going to take your details and sell them to a recruiter so I make some money. Then we'll just log what we've done so far, and then we'll send a response back saying, hi, welcome to the site. Except that's not really how code works, right? So when we validate stuff, I want to send back a different response, some kind of error message to you. I'm going to do an early return so we don't execute these other steps. But I do want to know about this, so I'm going to take the log line and repeat it in this piece of code. And the same for checking if you've already registered, right? We need to do all of these steps again, I guess. But to be honest, I, I don't really care if you registered or not. I can still take your details and sell them, so I'm going to repeat that line of code in there. And registration, well, registration can go wrong because of reasons, I don't know. But again, we're going to have to go through all of these steps. And look, it's happening again. We're taking this code that we can understand by reading through the steps involved, and we're doing this to it. Now, I'm thinking, well, what's the shape of this code? Is, this, is it the same shape as before? And it's a little bit more complicated, right? Because there are more details involved here, but it's roughly the same. We have these branches coming off. We have some repeated logic that gets used again and again. I think this looks kind of pretty, actually. But it's not easy to understand. What I really want is a nice linear sequence of steps that looks like this, so I can understand what's going on as the composition of these individual steps. But that's cool, right? We know how to do this now. We take our initial value A, and we lift it using some new type T, and we lift the behavior, and then we lift the exceptional conditions. It's always these same four steps, right? So we'll create a new type. I'm going to call this a sign-up request. And then we lift initial data. Well, the initial data here is for a request, right? So we've got response writer and the actual underlying request. We're going to lift the behavior. Now, lifting behavior means putting a new function onto our new type. So we'll take something like validation, and we'll put that as a new function on our new type. And we'll do the same thing for checking new registration, and so on. We're going to repeat this for all the steps we go through. And then finally, we're going to lift control flow. Right? So if we go back and look at this checking for new registration, we don't want to do this if you haven't given us this valid email address. Well, that's quite easy to add now, because we can just put a guard at the front of this saying, if, we, if something's gone wrong before, you know, if, if we had the problem, then we're not going to continue with checking for registration. We'll just return earlier from this function. And we do this again and again for all the different steps we want to go through. And then we can put it back together by composing the functions. Right? We take our initial values and we lift them up into our new type. And then we just call the individual steps one after the other. Now, don't do this. I tried doing this. It actually gets very, very complicated if you try and approach it like this. And I'm not trying to tell you how to write your handlers. And I'm really not trying to tell you how to write code at all. That's not what this is about. Instead of that, what I want to do is give you something new to think about. 
And in particular, I want you to start thinking about the shape of the code that you're writing. And as that gets complicated, think about using types to make those shapes more simple. Right? Perhaps I'm giving you some tools here and some tools that you can use to cope with your code as it becomes more complex. But I can't tell you what to do. It's up to you to decide how to use those tools for your situation. So I wrote that talk with that conclusion. And it's fine, right? But there's something about the ending that I don't really like. And it's this idea of using tools. It doesn't seem quite right to me. I think it's something more fundamental than that. So look, I can take this pen, right? And I can drop it onto the stage. And that works even if I have no concept of gravity, no theories about gravity. And that doesn't mean that gravity is not involved here or gravity is not what's pulling the pen down. It just means that using gravity doesn't depend on my theoretical knowledge about gravity. But that doesn't work if you try and solve more complicated problems, like if you try and launch ballistics or if you want to slingshot a satellite around Jupiter. I mean, you need to understand gravity really, really well to solve those very difficult problems. And it's not that gravity is a tool that we're using here. Gravity is describing the way the universe is. It's our understanding of how the universe works that enables us to solve very difficult problems. And so too with software, right? When I'm writing code, I tend to break things down into very small pieces so I can actually solve them. And at some point, I've got to take those pieces and put them back together again. And when I'm putting them back together again, I need to understand the forces that are at play here, the forces that govern the composition. So here's the good news. We know what these forces are. Understanding the forces is just knowing mathematics. And maybe this is what I was trying to drive at in my talk. It's not that I'm trying to show you a new tool that you can use. I'm trying to point to where this understanding lies so you can move towards it and understand it for yourself. And in understanding how this works, it will enable you to achieve an awful lot more to solve even more difficult problems. So I guess if there's one thing I want you to remember from the talk, it's this. Math is actually pretty useful. And it's pretty useful to us as developers. Because if we want to solve very difficult problems, it's going to be mathematics that enables us to do it. Thanks for listening. <laughs>